Black History Month is observed in the United States every February since 1976. And yeah, yeah. and I, I wasn't really, I mean, I know we do it. I, I wasn't really sure of the origination of Black History Month or Again, I know why, but I don't know. I didn't know why it was initiated. So I wanted to jump in and and dive into the history of Black History Month. And uh, I hope everyone listens. This is not going to be a politically affiliated episode. This is not going to try to sway anybody one way or another. This is strictly just based on historical facts and different stories that have happened uh, to and with and because of African Americans uh, throughout the history of the United States. Good morning, sister. Hiya, sister. Okay. I don't want to do a lot of small talk because I have 14 pages of Black History Month information to get through. Can I say I'm Jessica? (laughs) (laughs) You may say you're Jessica and I (laughs) may say I'm Ingrid. Ingrid May. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. And this is another situation. I was going to say another podcast. This is another podcast on another situation. Okay. I can't wait. I'm so excited. Okay. All right. So, um, like I said, 14 pages, I'm going to try to talk fast, but, um, also give attention to what needs to be given attention to. So, um, black history month, also known as African-American history month is celebrated in February in the United States. There are other countries that also celebrate black history month. Uh, the Canada, the Canada, the <laughs> Canada, <laughs> is that Canada. the Ohio state, the Canada. Uh, blah. <laughs> uh, all right. Canada, not hating on Ohio state, but we grew up in Wisconsin. Oh yeah, we are. So we're hating on Ohio state. <laughs> Okay. Canada, the Netherlands, Ireland, and the United Kingdom also have months dedicated to celebrating Black history. So the origination of Black History Month dates back to September of 1915, when Carter G. Woodson, who was a Harvard... Oh, let, actually, let me, sorry, start over by saying the information I got for this was from history.com and pbs.com. And there are other, a few other resources that I'll name when I get to those spots specifically, but okay. So the origination of black history month dates back to September, 1915, when Carter G. Woodson, who was a Harvard trained historian, um, born in 1875 to illiterate and former slave parents, along with Jesse E. Moreland, who was a prominent minister at the time, founded the association for the study of Negro life and history. Uh, which is now known as the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. The purpose of the ASNLH was to research and promote achievements by Black Americans and others of African descent. Did you say this was 1875 that they did this? 1875 is when Carter Woodson was born. Uh, September September 1915 is Is when um, it was created. Is when, yes, when he founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Um, And so the purpose of the ASNLH was to research and promote achievements by Black Americans and others of African descent. And, you know, so actually, um, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. That was 1915. And in 1926, the ASNLH supported, not supported, they sponsored a National Negro History Week. They chose the second week in February, and the reason they chose February was because of the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. So, yeah, so quickly, um, I mean, we we all know who Abraham Lincoln is, but just so brief, Lincoln was uh, born into poverty and he was self-educated. He became a lawyer, Illinois statesman, and congressman. In 1854, he became a leader in the new Republican Party. 
He ran for presidency in 1860 and served as the 16th president of the United States from 1861 until 18, 1865. He led the country through the Civil War and was notable for ending slavery. He was shot. I'm sorry. He was only president for four years. Because he was killed. Well, I know, but he did so much in four years. I th- I want to say, ooh, I might be wrong, but so I think he did his four years and then was reelected, but then was killed. Okay. Still, that's a short amount of time to mm-hmm. make huge changes. Right. Uh, right. 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 Um, so he was shot and killed by Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth while attending a play at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. with his wife, Mary. So, uh, so that's Lincoln. And then Frederick Douglass, the other individual that they wanted to align um, Black History Week uh, with. I want to talk about him for a little bit because I didn't know a lot. I, I'm sure I learned it a little bit in school. Um, I wasn't big into history back then, which is really disappointing because I love it now. Uh, but I also want to say that when I went to school way back then, um, that I don't know if we had a lot of education specific to black history. Do you, well, but back then when we were in like grade school, that was back when Africa on a map was smaller than the United States. I, I can't remember the name of that map. The one that was completely off. Was it like painted? Was it like an actual map in a textbook or was it painted like on the school wall? (laughs) No, it was an actual map in textbooks and in schools and you'd put Mm -hmm. them on the wall and it was, uh, they made Africa look smaller than the United States. It's kind of a play for power to show that Africa, like to demean Africa. Wow. That's interesting. Um, okay. So that was another reason that we're doing this, this episode. So, okay. So let's talk about Douglas. So he lived from 1818 until 1895, and he himself was unsure of what his birthday actually was. He was originally born Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey and Bailey was his mother's last name. His mom was of native American descent and his father was of African and European descent. He was an escaped slave turned activist, author, public speaker. He was one of the leaders in the abolitionist movement and continued to fight for equality and human rights and being a big supporter of women's rights until his death. So um, further into his life, because it was very interesting to me. Uh, So again, he was born into slavery. He was separated from his mother as an infant. Oh. And yeah, terrible. Um, he lived with his grandmother, Betty Bailey, until he was six years old. Then he was sent away from her to work at the YWYE house plantation in Maryland. He was given initially to um, Lucretia Ald, A-U-L-D. Her husband, Thomas, sent him to Baltimore to work for his brother, Hugh Ald. Hugh's wife, Sophia, taught Douglas the alphabet, and Douglas used that knowledge to teach himself how to read and write. He then, yeah. He taught himself how to read and write. He taught himself how to read and write. Then he used the Bible to teach other enslaved people to read. Wow. He was about 16 years old when others got wind of this. And, uh, Thomas old took him back and sent him to Edward Covey, C O V E Y. Um, I guess in a way to sort of teach him a lesson because Covey was known to brutally treat his slaves and, you know, Douglas was educating other enslaved people. And like I said, he was about 16 years old at that time. Uh, he, Attempted to escape multiple times and was finally successful in 1838. And he ended up in New York at the safe house of David Ruggles. While there, he sent for Anna Murray, who was a free black woman whom he had previously met in Baltimore. They were married in September of 1838 and they ended up having five children. Uh, The couple moved to Massachusetts And that's where he officially changed his last name from Bailey to Douglas. 
And he chose a name from the poem Lady of the Lake by Sir Walter Scott. And it's really interesting. It is. Yeah. Or, yes, really. And it's a, it's, it's a really interesting poem. I'm not going to get into it because I have 14, 13 more pages to go. <laughs> <laughs> I will have to look into that. That's a sound. It, it's kind of a cool, a cool story. So, uh, what? so, okay. So in this point, of his life, Douglas becomes involved in the abolitionist movement, and he becomes a public speaker at the prompting of journalist and abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. Was so he, Douglas, was he a white guy? William Lloyd. He, he, he is a white guy. I actually talk about him later. And in parentheses, I put white guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Douglas became an author of books. The most famous is his autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. He also published a newsletter called The North Star. He toured through the United States giving speeches, meanwhile, suffering brutal attacks during this tour. He lived through the Civil War. He befriended Abraham Lincoln, and uh, he disagreed with Abraham Lincoln um, with the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, because he thought the right to vote should have been given to enslaved people at that time, which was not. Wow. So wow. he did he did disagree with President Lincoln. Um, his let's see. Oh, he uh, he continued to advocate for equal voting privileges. He met with his previous owner. I'll say in quotations, um, Thomas Ald in 1877 and they actually reconciled which i think is really neat and very yeah i mean like what a what a warm heart huh progressive progressive and just you know that's a kind of an amazing individual to be able to reconcile with someone i know he wasn't the brutal um owner uh like covey was but still I think that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, Douglas's wife, Anna, Anna, A-N-N-A, is that Anna? Anna died in 1882. He married white activist, Helen Pitts in 1884. In 1888, he received a nomination for president of the United States, becoming the first African-American to do so. He, he didn't get the, the, um, full nod, but still that's, I think that's really cool. He died. This is crazy. He died in 1895. He had a heart attack while he was on his way home from a national council of women meeting because he didn't stop with, you know, I mean, civil rights for black Americans had a long way to go from this as we're going to hear, but he didn't just stop at wanting to help black Americans. He's, he's, he said, let's, we need women need to be equal as well. Oh, what an amazing yeah. person. Yeah. So that's Frederick Douglass. So um, let's flash back up to 1926. Uh, okay. Uh, so after establishing Negro History Week, schools and communities developed history clubs, organized lectures, performances, and celebrations. This grew to become more of a citywide event with mayors declaring this week um, throughout many cities in the country. In the 1960s, many colleges lengthened the week to encompass a full month, and they renamed it Black History Month. In 1976, Gerald, President Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month. He asked the public to, quote, seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of Black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. So let's do that. Let's go through, let's take a little tour through history. In 1619, slavery comes to North America. In 1793, so initially the uh, the enslaved people were used to work on the tobacco fields. And that sort of kind of plateaued. And uh, slavery sort of plateaued at that time. And um, in 1793, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. I remember that, like, this. Every kid remembers. I don't know I remember why. this. I, I don't. <laughs> well, you know why? Because I think they had us do projects with like cotton. Like it wasn't just like, oh, hey, by the way, this guy invented the cotton gin. There was like a big thing about it. I remember like gluing cotton to something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this then gave rise to the South to cultivate a new product and harvesting cotton is a labor intensive thing. So again, now we have slavery is taking a strong foothold again. Interestingly, in 1793, the uh, Congress also passed the Fugitive Slave Act. So this act made it a federal crime, crime, federal crime to assist an enslaved person from escaping. In, however, in 1808, Congress outlaws the import of new enslaved people. Did I, what I say? Outlaws the import. Did I say import? Yeah. Did I say outport? I think you, I think you said outport. <laughs> <laughs> See, because I'm reading words and just I'm mixing them together. Let's try that again. In 1808, Congress outlaws <laughs> the import of new enslaved people. Oh, well, that's good. Right. But the, the numbers of enslaved people have grown tremendously. Jeez. So that's like a drop in the bucket. Mm-hmm. In 1831, August 21st, to be specific, uh, Nat Turner ha- hosted, I guess, organized a rebellion. So Turner was a, a, an enslaved person. He, along with a small group, killed his owners. Uh, before I, I go on, I just want to say that when I use the term owner or owners during this, it's in quotations because that's what they referred to as back then. And I guess still even now, but I um, understand it's not a like an appropriate term, like And um, one thing I noticed while I was doing this, that to refer to those who are enslaved as enslaved people instead of slaves, because that kind of indicates, again, that they're more of a a property instead of an individual person, person, right? Gotcha. Okay. So um, August 21st, 1831, Nat Turner, who was an enslaved individual, along with a small group, killed his owners. Their plan was then to travel to Jerusalem, Virginia, to capture an armory and to enlist more supporters along the way. There were approximately 60 white people killed in two days by the group of black people numbering close to 75. There were around 100 enslaved people, which included innocent bystanders who were killed during this rebellion. Turner initially escaped but he was captured six weeks later. He was tried and then hanged. And that was, what was that? That was August 21st, 1831. Also in 1831, um, we're going to go back to William Lloyd Garrison. who is the white guy that we talked about <laughs> a little bit before. So he began the abolitionist newspaper called the liberator. And, uh, So again, that's 1831 that ran until the end of the civil war in 1865. Apparently he never missed an issue. I don't know how often the issue was published. It could have been once a year, (laughs) could have been every day. I'm not sure, but it it was noted. So it must be frequent enough to mention. Um, Garrison became known as the most radical of America's anti-slavery activists because he was one of the first individuals who actually promoted complete emancipation. And again, just Garrison. Yeah. Well, he and Douglas eventually disagreed on something. I didn't, I didn't dive in to find out what that was, um, but they actually never reconciled because huh. of whatever the disagreement was. Wow. Uh, in 1831, well, I don't know if it's specifically 1831, but around this time, the underground railroad becomes a bit more prominent. And this is something I did not, not understand. I didn't realize the underground railroad was around since the 1780s. 
I did not know that either. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, huh. 1857, Dred Scott, D-R-E-D, Scott, was an enslaved man who was taken from the slave state of Missouri, then to the territory of Wisconsin and, and Illinois, where slavery was outlawed. Then he was brought back to Missouri. At that time, he tried to sue for his freedom because he was taken to the uh, territory where slavery was outlawed. The Supreme Court ruled that Scott being an enslaved person had no right to sue, stating that Congress had no constitutional right to determine what happened with property when in oh. territory. Yeah, when in territories. So this then deemed the Missouri Compromise, which originally was passed in 1820. So this is 37 years later, was deemed unconstitutional. So I quickly looked at the Missouri Compromise and all this kind of political stuff really hurts my head. So I think I got the gist of it. It's where Missouri was a territory. They wanted to become a state. So the Missouri Compromise, I think Maine at the time was part of Massachusetts and wanted to become a slave free state. So the compromise was Missouri could become a state and they would be a slave state. Maine could become a slate, a state, and they would be a no slave state. Um, it had something to do with the other territories of the Louisiana purchase. Uh <laughs> But again, I don't, it hurt my head. And there is so much other information that there's a lot of constitutional stuff that happens <laughs> throughout our history, of course, uh, which I just don't, it hurts my head. But anyway, something, um, the Missouri compromise that was passed in 1820 is now deemed unconstitutional. In October 16th, on October 16th, 1859, was John Brown's raid. I sort of remember learning. I remember the name John Brown. Um, I do not. Can you refresh me? Yes, I, I surely will. So Thank John you. Brown was a Connecticut native and he was an anti-slavery supporter. Uh, he hosted a raid against the federal arsenal in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. The group of less than 50 men were eventually overpowered by state and federal troops. And he was martyred on December 2nd, 1859, as he was hanged for this. So the fact that a white guy was going to go through to such extreme lengths freaked out the South. And this started pushing them toward a pre-war status. There was always some, there were already some rumblings, but this was kind of like, Okay, this is now, now it's getting heavy because this just happened. There was white guys involved. <laughs> white, white guys are involved and they're it's getting serious. Yes, yes. Oh my goodness. So that was 1859. And in 1861, the Civil War officially begins. I didn't know that was actually the year it began. I didn't either. And I probably won't remember that after we finish recording this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, January 1st, 1863. Any guess? I wouldn't have known this. Do you know what it is? Did it end? No. Oh. It was, <laughs> it was the Emancipation Proclamation. On January 1st? 1863. No, I didn't know that. Yes. He made it, President Lincoln made it a, official that enslaved people, now listen to the wording enslaved people within any state or designated part of a state in the rebellion shall then thenceforth thenceforward and forever wait shall be then thenceforward and forever free so the wording of within any state or designated part of a state in a rebellion did not free enslaved people in the border states that supported the union. So oh. this is, this is only part of the rebellion states. It's the only part of the Confederate states. The only yes. Free Confederate. Yes. Wow. So, huh. right. I thought that was interesting. So regardless, the emancipation did free 3 million people. Holy crap. Mm -hmm. 186,000 black soldiers would end up joining and supporting the union army. By 
That's just the gave end, me the chills. I know. I know. <laughs> that's crazy. So by the end of the war, which was 1865, uh, the um there were 30 so from 1863 to 1865 38,000 black soldiers lost their lives the total dead at the end of the civil war was around 620,000 mm-hmm. right um in 1865 the 13th amendment officially abolished slavery however During that amendment, there were black codes that were initiated and these black codes sort of set the, um, set the groundwork, I suppose you could say for the Jim Crow laws. So the, the, these black codes and eventually the Jim Crow laws would control what jobs could be held by black people and at what compensation it controlled where they could live, how they could travel, and the Jim Crow laws really extended far beyond that. Um, 1870, uh, the 15th Amendment guaranteed that a citizen's right to vote would not be denied on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So, uh, unless that, they were women. Right. Just race, color, or previous condition of servitude, not gender. Right. Not gender. Well, even black women, like it makes it sound like black women could vote either and they couldn't either. Right. In 1896, Congress, the Congress, did, blah, 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 the Congress doctrine of separate but equal developed after the Plessy versus Ferguson case. I didn't write this down, which is annoying, but I, if I can remember correctly, I think it had to do something with railway cars. And how there were, you know, there, it was segregated. So there are different standards for the white cars versus the black cars. And what Congress decided was, um, even though the 13th Amendment, I think, I want to say it was the 13th Amendment, um, the 13th or 14th Amendment, one of them said something about there being equality. But this doctrine states that, well, as long as they're somewhat equal, we, that's okay. And they can be separated as long as there's somewhat equal or a considerable amount of equality. Uh, in 1900, Booker T. Washington encouraged Black Americans to seek out industrial or vocational education so that they could... Um, create a a niche for them within the United States economy. Um, George Washington Carver helped the South move from the sole reliability of cotton and encouraged that encouraged farmers to plant soybeans, sweet potatoes, and peanuts, because uh, if you don't rotate your crops, the soil kind of becomes depleted of nutrients. So you want to, you know, rotate through. So he was encouraging that to happen. And interestingly, Peanuts became the second cash crop for the U.S. in 1940. Um, so while Booker T. Washington is saying- Can I interject one thing? Yes, ma'am. I actually did find out that there's a process called disking for planting crops, and that's more better, more better. More better. It's, it's better for the soil than actual tilling. So disking is better than tilling. What does that mean? It's a type of, it's where you don't actually like dig claws, whatever, into the ground and upturn the ground. It's where you have like a disc that kind of looks like a Frisbee and it, you plant the seeds and then the disc slowly takes the, the soil next to where the seeds planted and then just gently lays it over. So you're not actually digging up the soil. So is a disc like horizontal or vertical? It's um, kind of at a 45 degree angle, actually. Oh, so neither. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Just a fun fact I learned the other day. All right. I'll remember that when I'm planting my acres of <laughs> <laughs> stuff. Okay. We might have some farmers listening. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, while Booker T. Washington was encouraging the vocational and um, industrial education, W.E.B. Du Bois. Yeah stressed the importance of higher education in black Americans saying, no, 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 
we need more than that. Let's, let's be, let's be educated. In 1909 on February 12th, which happens to be the centennial birthday of Abraham Lincoln, the creation of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and WACP. Yes. <laughs> okay. I just thought something so cheesy and I'm not going to do it. Um, yeah, you know me. <laughs> oh, that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you did it. I'm so glad it wasn't me. Okay. So the goals and the original goals of the NAACP were to abolish all segregation, to enforce the 14th and 15th amendments and to provide equal education for all. So one of the first actions was to put an end to lynching and other lawless acts. The (laughs) reason that's in there, which I totally skipped over this unintentionally. So in 1865, that's when the 13th amendment was passed. And then there was the initiation of the black codes the Ku Klux Klan was born in Pulaski, Tennessee. It started as a private club for Confederate veterans. <clears throat> so anyway, 1909, NWACP is trying to stop all that. In 1920, this is cool. 1920 was the beginning of the Harlem Renaissance, which is also known as the Black Renaissance or New Negro Movement. <clears throat> and this is the first time that there was a real look at African-American writers, musicians, and artists. So I'm going to name a couple because I think this is it's just so cool. Blues singer, Bessie Smith, pianist, Jelly Roll Morton, band leader. <laughs> I love it. Jelly Roll. I know. I love that name. I know. Band leader, Louis Armstrong, composer, Duke Ellington, dancer, yeah. Jos- Josephine Baker, and... Actor Paul Robeson were among the leading entertainment talents of the Harlem Renaissance. While Paul Lawrence Dunbar, James Weldon Johnson, Claude McKay, Langston Hughes, and Zora Neale Hurston were some of its most eloquent writers. So in 1941, do we know what happened in 1941? Uh, World War II started. You are so good, my little history buff (laughs) sister. So World War II started. So in, so in that, I can't, it's not a phase in that time, there were era. Thank you. (laughs) More than 3 million black Americans enlisted following Franklin, president Franklin D Roosevelt's call to fight for what he called the four freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want and freedom from fear. Our, Our presidents back then were just so cool. Uh, They're still cool. Yeah. All right. So, uh, the, (laughs) (laughs) this podcast episode is free of political free influence. The fifth freedom. (laughs) You're making fun of all of them. You're not making fun of them. Yes, I'm not (laughs) picking out one. (laughs) Not picking out one. All right. So this is this is cool. This stuff is so cool. All right. The war's first African American hero emerged in Pearl Harbor. So but yes, I know Pearl Harbor is dear to our hearts. Our grandfather was there. Now they made a movie about it. Or he was part of that movie. He was part of the Pearl Harbor movie. Well, yes, but that's not why it's dear to our hearts. It's grandpa. No, I know, but I just got excited because I knew what you were talking about. I knew who you were talking about. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> so Dory Miller was a young Navy steward on the USS West Virginia. And he carried wounded crew members to safety. And then he jumped and machine manned a machine gun post. And he shot down several Japanese planes. So, it's making me cry. I know. I'm telling you, I cried so many times writing this. In the spring of 1943, graduates of the first all-Black military aviation program created at the Tuskegee Institute in 1941 headed to North Africa as a 99th Pursuit Squadron. Their commander, Captain Benjamin O. Davis Jr., later became the first African-American general. 
Um, are you guys are watering again? I know it's, it's, oh, I love it. The Tuskegee Airmen saw combat against German and Italian troops, and they flew more than 3,000 missions. In 1947, Jackie Robinson was the first African-American player to play on a major league team. His first game was April 15th, 1947, and he earned Rookie of the Year. He and the Dodgers went on to win six league championships and one world series. They do. Yes. July, 1948. Oh, that, I think that was his baseball number. That's why I said it. Right. Wasn't he number 42? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, he played baseball. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope I'm not I knew that. that number up. I'm pretty, sure I don't know about the number, up. but I do know the Dodgers are baseball. <laughs> While you continue talking, I'm going to verify that. Comment. And I know that. Can you verify the end of the Civil War too? I said 1865, but can you just make sure that's correct? 42 is Robinson. Yes, okay. that was right. Uh, okay. Shall I carry Civil on? War ended April 9th, 1865. Okay, cool. So July 1948, President Harry S. Truman finally integrated the u.s armed forces under an executive i'm sorry order. what year i missed it Eight, 1948 wow so okay so this is this is one thing i don't know why i didn't write this down um in 1941 one of the things that i read were was that there again th- more than three million black americans enlisted those soldiers were going to war going to war against the enemies uh, or the opponents <laughs> of the United States. But as they're sitting there fighting side by side with their comrades, they're having to deal with the inequalities and the injustices of the segregation of black and white and the different treatment between the white soldiers and the black soldiers. Right. So July of 1948, seven years after the start of World War II, President Harry S. Truman finally integrates the U.S. Armed Forces. So he passed an executive order mandating that, quote, there shall be equality of treatment and opportunity for all persons in the armed forces, armed services without regard to race, color, religion, or national origin. Well, they, they, the Black soldiers coming back from World War II weren't treated as well as the white soldiers coming back either black Americans are just not treated well at all period. Yeah. yeah period. True, true. And you'll find out how bad it okay. was. So, uh, May 17th, 1954, the U S Supreme court delivers its verdict in Brown versus the board of education ruling unanimously. I think, I think this is directly from history.com. So this is, these are not my words. I purposely use different font for when I cut and paste it. <laughs> okay. So you're quoting. I'm quoting. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, because I don't think I could, uh, I, I just couldn't say this I, or my brain just couldn't work. I don't know. Okay. So May 17th, 1954, the U S Supreme court delivered its verdict in Brown versus the board of education ruling unanimously that racial segregation in public schools violated the 14th Amendment's mandate of equal protection of the laws of the U.S. Constitution to any person within its jurisdiction. Um, so Oliver Brown was the lead plaintiff in the case. And this, this ruling, this verdict, reversed that separate but equal doctrine. Um, and in this decision, Chief Justice Earl Warren famously declared that, quote, separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. So you can't have separate, but equal. If it's separate, then it's not equal. That gave me goosebumps again. What? So that gave me goosebumps again. I know. I remember seeing video clips of those black students walking into those public schools. Oh, that comes, that's coming. Is it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Because so let's listen, let's pay attention. That was 1954. So that's Mm -hmm. where separate but equal doesn't stand. We need to, we need to integrate the schools. This is awful. Okay. So 
Emmett Till, 14 year old boy from Chicago. He uh, went to visit some relatives in Money, Mississippi. So he was at a grocery store and allegedly he whistled and made a few flirtatious comments to the white woman who was working behind the counter. So that woman went home, told her husband. So he, along with, so her husband's name is Roy Bryant and Bryant's half-brother, J.W. Millam, M-I-L-A-M. Three days after this alleged grocery store encounter, these two guys go to Emmett's great uncle's house and they drag Emmett out of the house in the middle of the night. Oh, hold on. <laughs> um, they beat him and then they shot him to death and they threw his body in the Tallahatchie river. Um, he was, four, old four, was he? he was 14, 14. And I, I just, I can't even imagine that house. What do you do? You know, I, you know, there's a few people in that house and they're ha- trying to stop this anyway. Disgusting. Um, it's more disgusting. So these two men confessed to kidnapping Emmett, but they were acquitted of the murder charges by an all white, all male jury after barely an hour of deliberations. Uh, On what grounds were they acquitted? They, they didn't admit to killing him. They admitted to kidnapping him. And I guess he just happened to be happened to be found in the river, beaten and shot. Uh, they were never brought to justice later. They spoke with a journalist for look magazine and they gave vivid details of how they killed Emmett and the journalist, um, published their confessions and the headline of the article was called the shocking story of approved killing in Mississippi. Emmett's mom had an open casket funeral for her son in Chicago. And with the hopes yeah. that this would bring attention to his murder. Can't even imagine. There were thousands of mourners who attended his funeral. Jet magazine published a photo of his body. And all of this created international outrage and this, the outrage along with the verdict helped fuel the civil rights movement. Just, and this is a quote from history.com just three months after Emmett Till's body was found in a month after a Mississippi grand jury refused to indict Millam and Bryant on kidnapping charges, a citywide bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama would begin the movement in earnest. And that that gives me chills. Whew. Okay. December 1st, 1955, 42 year old seamstress and secretary of the Montgomery, Alabama chapter of the NAACP Rosa Parks refused to offer her seat on a bus to a white man. I wanted to say Rosa freaking Parks. <laughs> I'm According, sorry if I'm sniffing in, uh, sniffing in the microphone. I mean, I Can am. Can you hear too. me? Okay. I don't, I don't know. It's, you know, I'm going to mute myself or we just one big long sniff. Hold on. <laughs> oh, goodness. These people were so brave. So brave. Right. I know because you have no idea what's going to happen. She does this three months after this 14 year old boy was brutally killed. So, and according to the um, ordinance of Montgomery, Alabama, black passengers were supposed to sit in the back of the bus and they were supposed to offer their seat to any white passenger. So she was naturally arrested. And she, (laughs) Naturally, (laughs) naturally, (laughs) naturally. So she is quoted as saying, I had been pushed as far as I could stand to be pushed. 
I had decided that I would have to know once and for all what rights I had as a human being and as a citizen. So Ah, go Rosa, (laughs) Rosa freaking parks. So that's not disrespectful, right? Because I'm like, she's awesome. I I don't, I don't see it as disrespectful. I don't know if anyone else would. I don't mean it. And it's just disrespectful. Okay. Four days after her, her arrest, somebody may have heard of Martin Luther King Jr. Led the, <laughs> ma- may, may I, may I have. Sounds familiar. <laughs> I just sounded like dad. <laughs> <laughs> so he led the Montgomery Improvement Association in a boycott of the city's bus company. The boycott lasted for over a year. On November 13th, uh, so just, okay, I, I didn't write this down because I, I really assumed I would remember to say a lot of things. Uh, so this boycott, um, the African-Americans, I think, made up approximately 80% of the bus's revenue. Wow. And this boycott made that bus system go nearly bankrupt. Good. Uh, Yay. Good. So on November 13th, 1956, the Supreme Court upheld a lower court's ruling that the city's segregation ordinance was unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. This is where I write down what the 14th Amendment was. I, you know, earlier I went from 13th to 15th and I was like, shoot, the 14th Amendment was supposed to say something. Not supposed to. It did say something. (laughs) So the 14th Amendment prohibits the states from depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Okay. And so that was November 13th, 1956. The boycott was called off by King on December 20th, 1956. And Rosa freaking parks was one of the first to ride the desegregated bus. I'm crying again. (laughs) telling you I cried so many times reading this okay September 1957 remember we had that supreme court ruling in 1954 deeming segregation in schools as illegal well it was difficult to enforce I love that I wrote it how I should say it (laughs) so Orville Faubus F-A-U-B-U-S was the governor of Arkansas And despite the federal court ordering the desegregation of Little Rock's Central High School, Faubus requested the Arkansas National Guard to prevent nine black children from entering the school. Hold on. What? Yeah, let me, I'll finish this and then I'm going to go back. Yes. This happened quite a bit. I I am so sorry, but the history I remember learning, or maybe I just just preferred to learn it is that they invited the national guard to defend the students walking in. You are correct. So hold on a second. Oh, okay. So, well, he requested the Arkansas national guard to prevent the nine black children from entering school. And he was forced, I said, faced forced to call off the guard. TV cameras were able to capture angry white mobs just converging on the kids. So you have these nine innocent. I don't want to cry again. (laughs) I don't want to say timid because I don't, I don't know that they were timid, but I just, their kids. The video shows them holding their heads high and walking. Right, right. They're not, but they're freaking terrified. Oh, I'm sure. So TV cameras capture that. That goes national. Everyone's watching this disgusting behavior. So president Dwight, Dwight D Eisenhower sent 1000 members of the U S army's 101st airborne to enforce the integration. <laughs> he sent the 101st airborne to do it. A thousand of them. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is, this is, there's just so much, so much bravery happening. February 1st, 1960. Four of the Agricultural and Technical College of Greensboro, North Carolina, and I put in parentheses, black students, 
sat at a whites only lunch counter at Woolworths to order coffee. They were refused service, but they sat there until the store closed and they returned with more students the next day. And this prompted further peaceful protests or sit-ins amongst white and black Americans throughout college towns. All right, May, 1961, the Congress of Racial Equity, CORE, sent, oh yeah, okay, sent six white Americans and seven African Americans on a quote, freedom ride from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. And do you remember this? Mm -hmm. This was to test the recent court order, which ruled um, court court ruling to ban segregation in interstate bus travel, bus terminals, and restrooms. So these freedom riders that they were were coined, termed, Mm -hmm. um, called, (laughs) they were met with violence in Alabama. And one of the buses was actually firebombed. I don't know what firebombed is versus just bombs. Uh, I think they just use like gasoline firebombs, like oh, bottles okay. full of gas and put it on fire. <laughs> I pictured them walking out with like these big blow torches. All right. <laughs> That's the Vietnam War. <laughs> <laughs> so this brought or Robert. Maybe they did. I don't know. Sorry. I don't know. Go ahead. This brought Robert F. Kennedy's action in enlisting the state patrol to offer protection in Montgomery, Alabama, but there was persistent violence. So he sent federal marshals to accompany them to Jackson, Mississippi. And let's see. So September, so this happened in May and there was pressure from CORE. Uh, along with other civil rights organizations and from the attorney general's office, the interstate commerce commission ruled that all passengers on interstate bus carriers should be seated without regard to race and carriers could not mandate segregated terminals. Um, September, 1962, Ole Miss admits a black man named James Meredith. Uh and I looked up his, not his resume, but I, I believe he was a veteran. I think that he had already gone, received some college education. So he was a, um, he was not an, you know, an illiterate person or anything. He was definitely qualified to be admitted to the school. Um, and a mob of over 2000 met Meredith and a couple armed federal forces on his arrival. So two people were killed, nearly 200 injured. And Mm -hmm. President Kennedy had to send in 31,000 troops to restore order. Because one man was going to college. Yes. Ridiculous. That one man went to college in 1962 and he graduated May, 1963. Nice. Yes. August 1963 was March on Washington, where there were 250,000 people who wanted to draw attention to the inequality and challenges faced by Black Americans. And this is where Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous I have a dream speech. And in September 1963, which is obviously, it was just the next month, there was a third bombing in 11 days following federal order to integrate Alabama school system. This bombing was at a Baptist church in Birmingham and it killed four young African-American girls. In June, 1964, um, this is following president Kennedy's assassination. So president Kennedy was trying to um, advocate for a civil rights act bill And Congress was currently deliberating it when he was assassinated. So now acting president Lyndon Johnson helped push that act through Congress. So, and this is a quote, (laughs) if you'll notice, it's like all of the constitutional stuff and political stuff that I can't understand. I just quote, so at its most basic level, the act gave the federal government more power 
to protect citizens against discrimination on the basis of race, religion, sex, or national origin. It mandated the desegregation of most public accommodations, including lunch counters, bus depots, parks, and swimming pools, and established the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's EEOC to ensure equal treatment of minorities in the workplace. The act also guaranteed equal voting rights by removing biased registration requirements and procedures and authorized the U.S. Office of Education to provide aid to assist with school desegregation. Then... Let's see, that was what? June 1964. We're still in 1964, and this is this is really disgusting. So 1964 was coined Freedom Summer and um, something called the Mississippi Burning. So Freedom Summer is where Northern white students would travel to the South to assist Black Americans in registering to vote um, over the course of the three months of the summer. Um, and then Mississippi burning where I spent a little bit more time. I got some of this information from history.com, but I also went to the FBI.gov. So, uh, the Ku Klux Klan was after white New Yorker, Michael Schwerner, as he was particularly active in assisting voter registration. He also organized boycotts of biased businesses. The KKK, believing Schwerner was to be at a local church, burned it down and beat the churchgoers. He was not there, but he enlisted fellow white New Yorker, Andrew Goodman, and black Mississippian James Cheney to further investigate this. And um, ugh, so June 21st. They were initially arrested by Neshoba County De Deputy Sheriff Cecil Price for speeding when they arrived in Philadelphia, Mississippi. The three were released later that evening. So I think it's said they were arrested around 5.30 p.m. And they were released at 10.30 p.m. and drove toward Meridian in a blue station wagon. The KKK had previously been alerted to this and followed them. They were never heard from again. Oh on June 22nd, the FBI leads the investigation under request by Attorney General Robert Kennedy. June 23rd, the station wagon was found burned. There were no bodies in it. That's where they coined. Um, I like the word coined for some reason. That's where they came up with the, the name of the investigation is called Mississippi Burning. The National Guard was sent to assist from June 24th until August 3rd. All three bodies were found 14 feet below an earthen dam on a farm. On December 4th, more than a dozen suspects were indicted and arrested. This included Deputy Price, along with his boss, Sheriff Rainey. In so again, this happened. So June. 21st, 1964, October, 1967, an all white jury found seven of the defendants guilty, but none of them under murder charges. Um, one of the defendants found guilty was deputy price. So, uh, the what were they charged with? Okay. That's where I'm getting oh, to. Sorry. So the, the indictment for violating, uh, the, the three individuals civil rights was the only way to give federal government jurisdiction. So I think it was, you know, if they tried to indict them under something else, they would be tried the under state? Mississippi, under the Mississippi court, gotcha. which clearly was going to be biased. biased. Yeah. So I think they had to try to find charges that it, they could be tried, tried at a federal level. Hmm. Um, those seven defendants that were found guilty, none of them served for more than six years. Um, for killing three people. Mm -hmm. Edgar Ray Killen initially went free when a female juror could not bring herself to convict a Baptist preacher. Ah. Yeah, he was eventually convicted of manslaughter on June 21st, 2005, which is 
if you paid attention to the dates, that was a 41st anniversary of them. Oh, let's take my eyes water again. That's so, way too long to get justice. I, I read this story and it sounded so familiar to me and I couldn't figure out why, because I didn't feel like I learned it in school. And then I dug a little bit deeper and I found out there was a 1988 movie called Mississippi burning. It stars Gene Hackman and William Defoe. So I tried to find it, but while I was trying to find it, um, I did see that movie. And I think it is on Netflix, the Chicago seven it's, um, who's in it. Um, one of the guys is the guy from, uh, the, um, Harry Potter is not Harry Potter, but it's the other movie about the creatures. Oh, uh, magical beast. Yeah. 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 He's the one who plays, um, Newt, <laughs> Newt Kingridge, um, Newt Salamander, Scalamander. The main guy. Yeah. 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 Okay. So he's in the Chicago seven. <clears throat> If you haven't, you obviously you haven't watched it, watch mm-hmm. it. I was yelling at my TV. It's unbelievable. It was during the Vietnam war is the time frame. Um, okay. That was a lot of information. And I think maybe we need to break this into two parts. And in the meantime, you can watch the Chicago seven. Uh, you can also watch Mississippi burning. I believe it was on Hulu, but I don't have a Hulu account. So I did not get to watch it. And that's why I found the Chicago seven instead on, uh, Netflix. Okay. Okay. The next episode will continue with the history of black history month. See you in a few. (laughs) All right. Bye. Bye. If you'd like to reach out to us or submit your situation, please contact us at another situation podcast at gmail.com or find us on Instagram at another situation podcast. We're also on Facebook at another situation. Another situation is produced and edited by 0.5 Panoy. Music is written and performed by Tim Crow.